Hey everybody, so the video you're about to see um, has been re-edited to correct uh, some errors on my part. Uh, I want to thank Etty Edry from Yatir Winery. She's the export manager for them. And actually for Carmel, and who's, uh, who's the parent of Yatir. And uh, so I'd like to thank her for uh, doing a, a nice little phone call with me um, recently and to uh, give me some more information about the area and about the winery and to correct some pronunciations and other things. So you're about to watch... Uh, it's the original video, but I've inserted where I've made the mistakes. I inserted the corrections and also to um, add to some of the information that uh, Etty got to me. Uh, Etty gave me, I'm sorry. So um, let's get into the review right now on Leet Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Welcome to Late Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. So um, I was going to be recording some uh, Oregon recap videos, but I remembered I have some samples I have to do um, probably first. So um, let's just get right into it. So um, I had somebody contact me about some Jewish wines. Okay, right from the beginning, I completely hosed this. Um, these wines are from Israel. Um, they're not Jewish wines. And so you're going to hear me refer to the wines from, from Yatir as Jewish wines throughout the entire video. I don't even think I ever correct myself, even though I know better and I knew better. And even in my notes, I call it Israeli wine to myself. And even in the, the write-up uh, for the uh, video, it says Israeli wine. So I just want to apologize profusely. Like I, I, I talked to Etty about this. We don't call like wines from Italy Christian or Catholic wines, right? Um, I mean, Italy is like almost, it's not 100% Catholic, but it's a very, very Catholic oriented country. We don't call wines from there Catholic. We call them Italian. So that is a huge error on my part. And I do apologize profusely on that. Um, but yes, I'm going to keep referring to it as Jewish wines throughout the rest of the video. So just know that I actually did know better. I just, I don't know why I messed it up. So on to the rest of the video. And um, so they contacted me back in September and I was like, yes, you can send me the wines, but realize I'm going to Oregon and then I'm going to have all these interviews. So it's going to be a little bit before I can do, get the wines reviewed. So they were really promoting the wines for Jewish New Year, which has already passed. Uh, so that was... Um, September 30th through October 1st of this year, 2019. So um, I figured I'd me go ahead and just get these reviewed now because um, they are um, kosher for Passover also. So um, they have the OU, um, yeah, the OU and then the P on the back. So um, so they're they're considered kosher and for Passover. Now I, I, I'll. I'll be honest i'm ignorant about the rest of the holidays um if if the wines need to be kosher for um any of the other jewish holidays the next one that's coming up is hanukkah okay so this section of the video uh deals with jewish holidays i'm going to try to do some clarifications here uh so passover i got the dates correct hanukkah uh was december 22nd through the 30th it wasn't really mentioned passover is the 8th through the 16th in 2020 the website I was using, the way it was laid out was super confusing. By the way, I'm going to stop doing the whole bunch of tabs open, um, but that's covered in episode 501, so you can watch that. The only other holiday where uh, wine can play a larger part is Purim, which is the Jewish Halloween, and uh, it's actually a cool story. Look it up, but it's basically the story of Esther, or Esther and Ham <coughs> King Haman, um, who was a king in Persia, uh, or Haman. Um, 
So it's about that story. And so check it out. Cool story. And uh, get back to the video. Which um, this episode is going to come out right the, like the week before that. That's why I'm doing it now in case um, these wines are legit for, for Hanukkah. And if they're not, well, then you have a wine review to research for Passover next year, which is uh, looks like it's the same dates. No, let's see. Wait a minute. I had it. Oh no, different dates, different dates. Uh, so next year, uh, that would be April 9th through the 10th. And then it says 11th through 14th and then 15th through 16th. So yeah, uh, forgive me. I'm pretty ignorant about, about the stuff, but I'm not ignorant about wine. That's for sure. So, uh, Jewish wine. So this is like the first time in several years that I've done some Jewish wine and, um, Forgive me, I didn't research it on my website which one it was, but um, I did I did a review of some Jewish wines a long time ago, and when you look at the embed code from um, from YouTube, it's like one of my one of my uh, higher reviewed higher viewed wines. So let's get into some wines here. Um, so uh, this estate is the Yadder Estate, um, the Yadder Winery. And uh, they are actually owned by Carmel, and um, this is more of a boutique winery. So the wines I got sent, you cannot find on their website. Um, also, the email that I got does not have the pricing on it, so I will be emailing the person who sent me the wine saying, hey, I need the prices. Um, so I'm just gonna assume that they're widely available if I'm getting them for review. It's just they're not on the website. Um, so the first wine is the 2017 Yadder Mount Amasa White from Judean Hills. So Judean Hills is in the uh, basically eastern part of Israel, uh, the West Bank uh, area. And um, uh, let's just put this, they've been, they've been making wine for like thousands of years in Israel. Uh, kind of the on and off thing, you know, sometimes they don't make it, sometimes they do. They've been doing it recently. Uh, there's definitely some really good Israeli wine uh, being made out there, uh, it's not all Manischewitz, and not to disparage Manischewitz, but it's, man, it's not, man, you know, Manischewitz is Manischewitz. All right, so um, it's basically grape juice. I, hey, I'm sorry. It just, it's just, it's, it's like Sutter Home White Zin. It's White Zin. Um, it's sweet wine. Anyway, so this wine is a combination of, I think, three white grapes. So it is Viognier, 52%. Chenin Blanc, 33%, and Roussan, 15%. A nice little combination of grapes here. I'm pretty excited to try it. Um, it sound a little Christopher Walken-like, I guess. I don't know. I'm not even going to attempt it. <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, they'll, hopefully I'll have a price in the lower third. And um, let's see. I'm just kind of, before I even get to the wine... Uh, so the Yadda region, located in the southern tip of the Judean Hills, has a rich and fascinating history of wine production. Passersby and onlookers can view the extensive and impressive wine press, a testament to a developed wine industry of over 2,500 years, dating back to the first reign of the kings of Judah. Um, let's see here. A large center of Jewish settlement existed in this region between the periods of the destruction of the Second Temple to the inception of the Islamic period. Uh, the livelihood of these early farmers was based mostly on growing and processing grapes and olives. The region was known as one of the finest growing, finest for growing vines uh, for the purpose of winemaking. And from this very region, wines were later exported to Egypt, Rome, and across Israel. Okay, so um, I'm about to mention a gentleman's name here, and I, I basically got it right. It's David Ben-Gurion. Um, and uh, he's not only the person who planted the forest, the Yatir forest, but um, he's basically the father of modern Israel. So this dude's like super important and you really should know who he is. Look him up. He's super cool. Um, so yeah. And then um, I, I kind of struggled on Negev. I was really uncertain how to pronounce it, but I, I kind of got it right in the video, but uh, it's Negev. All right, back to the video. Uh, so a gentleman by the name of David Ben Gurion had a dream of making the Negev region bloom and blossom 
And so when he wanted to plant a forest in the Yadda region, which there's a forest there uh, now, um, he consulted with selected experts to guide him through the process after numerous discussions and assessments. The agronomists determined that the region, which was overly dry and warm, was unsuitable for planting trees. Um, he had other plans in mind, replace the experts, he said, and rightfully so, the forest which borders the desert, which was planted in a semi-arid semi region, became one of Israel's largest forests, stretching approximately 40,000 dun dunams. Okay, so I was close, dunam. And um, it's basically a quarter of an acre. Uh, I know I did, in the lower third, I have what it is, but yeah, it's a unit of measure. All right, that's it. Don't know what that is. Uh, I'm going to assume it's, you know, like acre and hectare, but it sounds like there's a lot of trees there. And like, hmm, guess who was right? Um, so the forest was named after the Levite biblical city of Yadar or Yatir, I'm just kind of guessing on that, uh, whose ruins remained in great destruction. The site serves as a green lung and a hiking site, as well as an experimental model for innovative methods for combining, combating desert, desert, desertification. Sorry, it's kind of late. Uh, and I've been up for a long time. Uh, let's see here. The forest became a significant ecological tool and over the past several years has been researched by numerous scientists in the heart of the largest planted forest in Israel in valleys and slopes surrounded by a myriad of trees such as Jerusalem oaks, carob, pistachios, pine, and olive trees. The Yadar winery vineyards were planted. Uh, I believe I mentioned that uh, the Carmel winery is you know, the, the owner of it uh, who started it. And, um, let's see what else that's, that's the highlights. There's plenty of other stuff on their website. I'll have a link below to their website. Um, let me see if there was anything else in here on the, uh, the whole inner tubes that I wanted to, uh, so the modern Israeli wine industry was founded by Baron Edmund James D. Rothschild owner of the Bordeaux estate Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Uh, today, Israeli winemaking takes place in five vine growing regions. Okay, so this was the hardest part or the, the, the part that's gonna be the hardest to watch because I really, really mess up a lot of this stuff. Um, so first off, this is about Israeli, the Israeli wine areas. So the first one, uh, Samson, just it's Samson. Don't worry about anything else. The other one is, is somehow it's, it's spelt a different way but it's Samson. Uh, the next one, the Sharon Plain. Like, why I said Sharon, I really don't know because I do know that it's pronounced Sharon. Um, the next one is uh, Zakron uh, Yaakov. And that translates to Jacob's dream. And once I realized that Yaakov is Jacob, it made a world of sense. Um, not that I knew that Zakron is dream, but Yaakov is Jacob. And then the last one... Um, uh, I struggle with, but the funny thing is on my phone call with Etty, I pronounced it like correct. Just, I flat out just said it. So Binyamina. Um, so that's all of them there. It was really hard to watch that. Especially now knowing what it, how it's correctly pronounced. So there you go. Galilee, including Golden Heights, which that's where I've had wine before on the show. Uh, the region most suited for viticultural, for viticulture, Due to its high elevation, cool breezes, marked day and night temperature changes, and rich, well-drained soils. The Judean Hills, where these are from, uh, surrounded by the city of Jerusalem, Shimshon or Samson, uh, located between the Judean Hills and the coastal plain. Uh, the Negev, a semi-arid desert region where drip irrigation has made grape growing possible. And the Sharon Plain near, near the Mediterranean coast, just south of Haifa, surrounding the towns of Zikron, uh, Ya'akov, ya, ya Y-A apostrophe A-K-O-V, Ya'akov, I'm thinking, I'm guessing, and Binyamina, 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 maybe that's it, 
which is the largest grape growing area in Israel. Um, see, several of these terms for Israeli wine growing regions, such as the Judean Hills, the Golan Heights, and the Shimshon, actually refer to areas that are largely Israeli occupied territories. Uh, the definition of wine is produced in the latter as Israeli is a subject of legal contention abroad. All right, um, I'm not going to read the entire Wikipedia entry of Israeli wine. Uh, maybe I'll put a link to it, but uh, definitely a rich history in making wine. Let's see. Um, the Carmel Winery was founded in 1882, by the way. Um, it's the largest winery in Israel with a local market share of almost 50%. Uh, they, may, they make wine, brandy, grape juice. Prime producer of wine in Israel, uh, half of half of the Israeli wine market. Oh, sorry. Let's see here. Um, also, the largest producer of kosher wine in the world. It, the company is owned by the Council of Vine Growers, seventy-five percent, and the Jewish Agency for Israel, twenty-five percent. Its parent company is the Society Cooperative Vigneron des Grandes Caves, Rishon Le Zion and Zikron Yaakov. Wow, that's a lot right there. Uh, holds the two largest wineries in Israel, Rishon Le Zion and Zikron Yaakov, um, as well as two new smaller ones, y Yatir or Yatir and Kayumi Winery. It has uh, 1,400 hectares of vineyards in Israel. And they produce 15 million bottles per year. Okay, so to address the ownership, uh, that's outdated information from uh, 2012 on Wikipedia. Since 2013, ownership is now private ownership. Uh, Carmel, not Carmel, but Carmel Winery uh, is the parent winery, uh, and there's private ownership of that. And then Yatir is one winery. Uh, Kayumi is a winery, but it's also a vineyard. And so... I think that's the information was really referencing referencing the vineyard that Carmel uses. So when you look it all up, it's more about Kayumi Vineyard, not Kayumi Winery. All right, so back to the video. All right. Again, I won't go through their entire history. And I already kind of explained where Judean Mountains are. All right, cool. Let's get into the wine. All right, so uh, on my phone call with Etty, she gave me some more information, and I'm going to try to work this in uh, at, a, at a good spot in the video here. Um, so I tried to take some notes what was going on. So you've got, so there's a mountainous region in the north of Israel, and then as you go farther south, you have the northern shore and you have the Judean hills, um, and they're higher altitudes, so you get cool summers and cold winters. Um, and then you keep going uh South of that, you get the Negev, and then also you get a cool breeze from, um, so in the area where Yatir is, uh, that's in the southern Judean hills in the Negev. So you get a cool breeze from the Judean, but you also get uh, dryness from the desert area, and they've got cold winters there. Um, the soils in that area, uh, the northern part are volcanic, and then you have what's called the Syrian breakage, and these, so some eruptions of volcanic soil. Um, at Yatir, their soils are a combination of clay, calcareous, and limestone. Uh, you get really good drainage, but they don't get a lot of rain. Um, they, they get anywhere between 100 millimeters and 200 millimeters. I'll put the conversion down there um, as to what that is in inches. Um, but yeah, not a lot of rain. And to kind of get back to Ben Gurion, um, so, I mean, he was a farmer who wanted to make the desert bloom and he planted the trees. They all told him, don't do it, right? And I'm pretty sure I've already mentioned this in the video. Um, but the Jewish National Fund helped with that and they've been planting trees since 1960. They have 4.5 million trees and it, they call it a desert forest. And, um, I mean, they, they bring in people from all over the world to kind of show that you can actually do this. I mean, everyone told Ben Gurion, don't do this. And he was like, I'm going to do it, and, which I already mentioned in the video. But he did it anyway, and that's pretty amazing. Um, and by doing this, they kind of changed the microclimate by creating some more humidity. So they left empty plots inside the forest so they could allow farming, um, including 
vineyards, not just vineyards, but other farming. Uh, and this is like the Judean tribe area from what Eti told me. Um, and whose symbol is the lion, which is part of the symbology with, with the winery and everything. Um, and the whole area is called the Yatir region. So, and then uh, I'm going to mention, it's, it's one of the wines, Amasa. Uh, he's a biblical hero. So, and there's actually a mountain called Mount Amasa. So that's where the connection is for uh, that wine, which is the last wine or the second wine in the review. Um, and then, yeah, that is the majority of the notes that I took that I wanted to kind of add in there. So kind of perfumey, kind of floral. Um, yeah, Viognier, dude. A little peach, a lot of floral, a lot of, uh, a little bit of peach, kind of waxy peach, peach candle. Peach uh, paraffin, getting wax. Uh, peach candy, but with the wax paper, so wax, right? Yeah, apricot. A little bit, of, well, floral for sure, not a little bit, but floral for sure. I like white flowers. And almost like a bit of honey. All right, let's check it out. So the palate is very much like the nose. You got the peach, you got the paraffin, wax, whatever you want to call it. Um, touch of orange to it, um, like a, like a little orange candy to it. Um, really pleasant, really smooth. Um, yeah, like this is like delicious wine. I have no idea what the cost is, but again, it should be in the lower third by now. It tastes like a well-made wine. As far as, you know, is it expensive? Probably not. But yeah, really tasty. I like it a lot. Like, I'm excited to like crush this bottle at some point in time. I mean, I can see this as a holiday wine, in, in, so to speak, as long as it's cool to drink it on, you know, whatever Jewish holiday, you know, comes up. Um, it's a well-made wine, some really good food pairings. I would kind of like to try to pair it with maybe some, some foods with some spices to it, um, because there's also a bit of potpourri. I mean, it's a floral is like the big thing but like a potpourri, but a little bit of spice characteristic to it. But yeah, it's nice. I like it. I like it a lot. I have two glasses because I was supposed to record the organ stuff and then I realized I had the Jewish wines. So instead of rinsing this one out, which I could have done because I had to rinse this one out so I could polish it so it looked a little bit better than it did. Um, now I have a red one. So let's get into the red one. So this is the 2016 Yatir or Yatir, uh, Yatir Creek, Judean Hills. Um, this is 76% Syrah, 12% Tanat, and 12% Malbec. Uh, aged for 12 months in large oak casks or fudras followed by a further two-year maturation in the bottle. What about this one? Uh, forgot to tell you, yeah, the back label is the only place I can find information on these two wines. Um, well, hold on. The, um, the, the email gives me just a little bit extra, but let's go through the back labels first. On the white one, um, you have forced again, fermented and matured for five months in a combination of concrete, amphora, 500 liter oak barrels and stainless steel vats. All right, so let's see here. Um, so the vineyard's at an elevation of 680 to 780 meters. So multiply that by three. So 20, so what, uh, 2100 to 25 ish hundred feet. Um, limited oak barrel aging allows, yeah, I'm not going to go through that. Um, and then the red wine, 
let's see here. Uh, those elevations are 650 to 900, so, you know, uh, 18 to 1900 up to 2700, 28, 2900 maybe feet uh, above sea level where the soil is clay and chalky, aged in lark oak, oak barrels for 12 months and matured in the bottle for two years. It will mature in cellar well for, for 10 years. Pretty much what I already said. All right. Let's check this out. Anytime I got Tanat in a wine, I'm excited to check it out. All righty. Again, don't know the price as I'm doing it, but it'll be in the lower third. Man, I think I probably should clean the needle. Kind of wipe it down and make it easier for it to get into getting in and out of the cork. Let me see. I don't know. It feels pretty smooth. Sometimes these corks are just really difficult. All right. Nice little combination there. Really red fruited. Really rich on the fruit. Uh, you can smell the oak. That, you know, vanilla, vanilla pie, like dark raspberry pie. Clove, cinnamon, you know, the typical uh, oak aromas. Not quite a lactone thing, you know, like the bourbon barrel stuff, but yeah, you can definitely smell the oak. Fruit definitely comes through again. A little bit of rusticity to it, a little bramble. Tannins starting to kind of creep up on you. I would assume it's more from the tanat than anything else, but Syrah can be somewhat tannic. Um, definitely not from the Malbec. I think the Malbec's probably giving it some extra color to it. It's not a lot of Malbec, it's only 12%. Um, but Malbec can really give you that more purplish color. It's kind of dull, like not in a bad way, just red wines a lot of times are dull. Like uh, not, not like bright type of thing. Um, not cloudy, so to speak, but a lot of purple to it. But there's, only because I'm looking for it, because there's Malbec in it, there is a slight bit of that electric pink, you know, or electric purple rim, but I'm not sure if that's just how it is or the Malbec's actually contributing that. In some ways it's more spice driven than fruit driven, but I think there's a good balance between the two. Um, I think it's a easy drinking wine. I think a lot of people will like this wine. It's not necessarily my style of wine, but I mean, I'm definitely going to drink this wine at some point. And it's not going to be like, you know, 10 months later. I mean, I'm going to drink it. Um, but a touch of chocolate to it. Um, I can see a lot of people liking this wine, especially, you know, in a holiday situation where you just really need wine just to facilitate the holiday. It's not, it's not about the wine. It's kind of growing on me because the spice components are really starting to come, come to the surface a little bit more. It's starting to not push out the fruit, but it's becoming a little more earth and spice driven than, than fruit driven. The nose, more fruit than anything else. And the palate's kind of like, kind of like, man, you had your chance. Now it's my turn. Um, I like the wine. It's growing on me for sure. I think if it needs to be a wine, if I could open, like I open the bottle and I'm just going to like hang out with it, I'll probably like it even more. All right. So some final thoughts before that guy over there signs off the video. Uh, I really want to thank, uh, Vicki actually, cause I haven't even mentioned her yet. Uh, she was, uh, the woman, uh, who got all this set up initially. She, from her PR firm that, uh, contacted me, sent me the wines and initially contacted me about 
you know, the errors that I had in this video and coming up with a way to come up with a resolution so I can fix all this because, you know, it needs to be fixed. Uh, and she's the person who actually got me in contact with Etty. And I really appreciate Etty taking her time um, during, I'm sure, a busy time for everybody. And uh, it was about a 45 minute phone call, honestly. It was through WhatsApp, but it still was, a, you know, 45 minutes of her time to uh, kind of give me some information and kind of correct some, some of the errors I had in there. And, you know, really just kind of just chatted about a bunch of stuff. And, you know, not that, not that I didn't have, you know, uh, plans to ever visit Israel, but, you know, Israel is like a cool place to visit, not just for the wine, but just historically. And I kind of talked to Etty about that. You know, it's not just a wine area, which, you know, has a long history of wine growing, um, but just the historical significance uh, of everything in that region would be just cool to go to. So at some point, I hope, at some point in, in, in whether it's the elite wine side or just my personal side, to go visit the area and meet Etty and visit the wineries down there and just, have, I'm sure I'll have a great time. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank everybody involved. Uh, apologize profusely for if I, you know, for all the mistakes I made during the video. Hopefully I've uh, resolved all those and, uh, you know, really taught me to be a little more mindful and do more research, not just with what I did with the Israeli wines and Hebrew and all that kind of stuff and history, but, you know, all the other wine areas that I, that I cover way more often and try to be more cognizant of of uh, getting it right the first time and not have to like type something in a description or put a lower third down there, you know, just get it right the first time. All right. So that's going to do it. I'll let this guy sign us off. We'll see you guys soon. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode. Um, hope you have a wonderful Hanukkah, which is coming up soon. Um, did I put, the, did I say where the dates were? Uh, yeah, they were there in there somewhere. Um, anyway, or if you're not celebrating Hanukkah, you're celebrating, you know, any other holiday, hope you have a good one. The next episode is the Christmas episode. That's kind of why I needed to do this one. Um, and then it'll be New Year's and then the Oregon recap ones. You know, recording those like next. Just because it's more fresh in my memory. All right, so you can click the links above to frame me up. Click the links below to learn more about all this kind of stuff. Israeli wine and... Um, Carmel Winery and the Yadder Winery and blah, blah, blah. So check it out. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time.